Well, welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar this afternoon. Um, I'm so delighted that you can all join us wherever you are um, calling in from. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how European states can integrate their commitments to the responsibility to protect within their national policies. Um, my name is Kate Ferguson. I'm co-executive director at Protection Approaches. What this seminar series is looking at is the fact that no region can ever be immune from the risks of identity-based violence and mass atrocity crimes. We know that Europe's experience of the Holocaust, of perpetrating colonial violence, uh, more recently of the atrocities that occurred in former Yugoslavia or in Crimea, they continue to shape our region and they've left very deep legacies that are enduring. Trends across Europe that elsewhere are considered to be indicators of rising risk of identity-based violence and mass atrocity, such as social fracture, democratic backsliding, um, increased public bigotry. In many parts of our region, these continue to go in the wrong direction. And at the same time, many of the world's greatest crises from Xinjiang to Myanmar to Tigray, they're being fueled by atrocity crimes. And so today's conversation is the first in a series of online seminars that will explore Europe's responsibility to protect populations from mass atrocity crimes, to uphold its commitments to prevent the propellants of violence and to help ensure that that principle that was universally adopted at the United Nations in 2005 evolves so it's able to meet changing threats and also rising expectations. This is a series of, of conversations online that is co-hosted with our very great friends at the European Centre for the Responsibility to Protect, where I'm also lucky enough to be Chair of Policy. And I extend enormous thanks today and always to their wonderful, wonderful team for their work and particularly behind the scenes ahead of this event. And of course, as we progress throughout that seminar series. Um, housekeeping, this event is being recorded Please tweet and share what our fantastic speakers have to say. Use the hashtag RTP Europe so we can keep a track of what you're thinking of the conversation. And do write any questions that you might have um, in, in the box, but you all know the rhythm of these events um, by now. Um, so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. First, we have Alicia Kearns, who has been a member of parliament for Rutland and Melson for the Conservative Party since 2019. She previously worked in communication roles in the Ministry of Defence, the Ministry of Justice and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, where she led government communication campaigns in Syria and Iraq for the FCO, and at the Ministry of Justice worked as the Victim Minister's Press Secretary. She currently co-chairs the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Bosnia and Herzegovina and currently serves on the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, where she has tirelessly raised issues of atrocity prevention, the persecution of the Uyghurs and multilateral issues relating to multilateral organisations. We have Belma Sharic, who is a researcher and journalist, a peace building expert, a human rights defender, um, and all round sort of um, frontline activist on issues of atrocity prevention and R2P. She's calling in from Sarajevo in Bosnia -Herzegovina, in Bosnia Herzegovina. She has, I mean, just so much experience, I think around 20 years. Uh, she is founder and president of the Post-Conflict Research Center um, in Sarajevo, founder and editor in chief of um, Balkan Discourse. And before that, uh, was a journalist at the Institute for War and Peace Reporting in London, The Hague and Vienna, where she spent eight years reporting war crime trials and investigating the transitional justice processes in former Yugoslavia. She's currently a fellow at University of Columbia. Um, and I mean, I could just keep going. Her, her CV is fabulous and I'm really delighted she is able to join us today. Last but not least, Luke Dockendorf, who has just been a tireless champion of R2P for such a long time, has been a career diplomat since 2006, currently serving as a uh, counselor for human rights, international organizations and cyber policy issues. I think that's correct, it's quite a mouthful, um, are for the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of Luxembourg. 
Um, since 2015, he has been Luxembourg's national focal point for the responsibility to protect and um, has just really been such a prominent voice within that world for such a long time. Um, at the national level, he coordinates the Interministerial Committee for Human Rights and Interministerial Committee for Cybersecurity. I'm particularly delighted that Luke is able to join us today um, because his time as R2P Focal Point, I believe, is coming to an end, but he, in the summer, is moving on to become Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations in Geneva, where I'm sure, um, in no doubt, he will continue to bring that knowledge and energy to advancing R2P to the Human Rights Council and beyond. So I'm sure you'll agree we have an absolute stellar lineup um, and we will just jump right in. You don't need to hear any more from me. Um, we start with just a nice opening question to our panel, which is why is R2P, why is the responsibility to protect populations from atrocities important for Europe? And we will go straight over to Belma. Thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so, so much for the invitation and organizing this important panel. Well, uh, for us here in Bosnia, but also in the region of Western Balkan is extremely important if we take a look back to our recent history and the whole struggle we are dealing now in post-conflict transformation and in post-conflict society. Since 1995 and the genocide took place in Srebrenica in Bosnia, the whole region generally of Western Balkan, but definitely affecting the whole Europe is recovering from the horrors of war. Uh, many forms of, 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 of different violations of human rights are still going on, uh, on the ground, especially on a grassroots level. And we are dealing currently with um, uh, the last phase in genocide, which is genocide denial. Uh, beside, beside genocide denial and mass atrocities denial, uh, we are dealing also with all these post-transitional um, issues as uh, memorialization, the question of memorialization, how it will be sorted out. We don't have a state law. Unfortunately, even now, we don't have a state law which will regulate the way how we will commemorate the, the recent past. On another hand, the country, uh, the whole country is still ethnically divided, especially affecting young people. Uh, to, to, to illustrate a little bit, in a country with 170, 186 ministries, we still don't have a state ministry for education, which means literally that young people, youth in our country and the region, they are, they are teaching recent past and history through different curriculums mostly being affected by family narratives uh, uh, who are of course affected by, by, by recent war. Uh, in Bosnia, we still have this, um, for me, the, the, the best example of pure segregation, two schools under one roof. Uh, two schools under one roof is, is basically a, a school where uh, you have young people, pupils going in the same physical building, but they are separated through curriculum, uh, history teaching practices, device narratives, and they don't even interact between each other on a high school breaks. We have 56 schools, according to a recent OSC uh, report in Bosnia, still working under the system of two schools under one roof. Um, there is uh, a need, a deep need uh, for whole region, not just Bosnia, but that includes the Europe, to take a look much more closer how actually the work related to genocide prevention and conflict prevention and how the RTP will be involved into our educational curriculum. Because I just mentioned genocide denial, but the, the, the next huge problem is rehabilitation of war criminals and celebrating war criminals as heroes. Uh, we, we, we are witnessing this phenomenon every single day. And for us at Post Conflict Research Center, we've been working closely with the United Nations Office for Responsibility to Protect and Genocide Prevention, but I can mention that a little bit later. This is just kind of like introduction for why RTP is necessary in, in, in Bosnia and region and Europe. Thank you so much. And there's just so much kind of richness and that this sense of this responsibility sort of stretches across so many different dimensions. Um, Luke, you've been um, observing the evolution of RTP from a European perspective for some time. Um, why is it so important for the region? Thanks very much, Kate, and, and thanks also to, to Velma for, uh, for her overview 
Um, and it's it's really this quote by uh, by William Faulkner that the past is never dead and it's not even the past that I think rings true also for Europe. Uh, and it is perhaps felt much more acutely in some places than others where uh, the memory of mass atrocities isn't just the preserve of, uh, of a select few of unfortunately fewer people uh, every year who have lived through uh, uh, the horrors in our case of, uh, of World War II and the Holocaust, but in their case, there are many, many people with living memory of, uh, of mass atrocity, of genocide, of uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Um, I'll be speaking to you from Luxembourg with the uh, the experience, of course, uh, which is much further away. Uh, and for us, uh, Europe, of course, isn't just the European Union, but uh, the European Union is, from our perspective, very tightly interwoven with uh, the, the post Second World War history of uh, of Europe and of uh, of peace on the continent. Uh, and Europe, the European Union, was started as a peace project, as really this idea that. Um, if you cooperated on uh, the uh, industries that made peace possible, uh, made war possible, coal and steel uh, in this uh, sense, uh, you would not only make uh, war unthinkable, but materially impossible. Uh, and uh, I think that's something that, that the entire European project was founded on, uh, not just the European Union, also the Council of Europe, which uh, predates the European Union in a sense, and also goes beyond its borders because it covers uh, 47 states on the European continent. Uh, also the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and uh, a number of other, other international organizations. Um, why R2P, which is something that we often think of as uh, a responsibility that's happening in, uh, in faraway places, also applies to Europe, is really uh, this idea that, um, well, things have happened in the past, but uh, it's, uh, I want to say it in the, in the words of Primo Levi, who said that uh, it happened, therefore it can happen again. Uh, that is the core of what we have to say. It can happen, and it can happen anywhere, everywhere. Um, that doesn't mean that mass atrocities have to happen, uh, because there are a lot of known warning signs uh, that tell us, oh, something bad uh, is about to happen. And the Office of the Special Advisor on, on Genocide Prevention and Re the Responsibility to Protect of the United Nations has uh, actually elaborated uh, quite a solid uh, framework of analysis uh, for mass atrocities. And uh, a lot of NGOs, a lot of academic researchers, uh, protection approaches is, is one of them, uh, are dedicating their entire time to studying how mass atrocities happen and what we can do to prevent them and what early action needs to happen in order to follow up logically from, uh, from these early warning signs. Um, but we need to be open to the reality and to the possibility uh, of them. And we also need to be open, and I want to close with that, that no matter the level of um, economic, socioeconomic development, or even political stability we have uh, attained, uh, all of us individually have it in us to be both uh, perpetrators of terrible things uh, and also victims of terrible things. And beyond that, uh, there's, there's not a fatality that we have to, we have to be in either of those roles. We can also be, uh, of course, bystanders, seeing something bad happen and doing nothing about it, uh, or upstanders, rescuers, people who do something about, uh, about the bad things that happen. And I think that reality uh, may be for many of us further removed in Europe uh, than for others, but certainly not everywhere. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about the many cases that are ongoing right now where Europe is, uh, should be doing more to uh, live up to its, uh, its promises. Um, but it, again, it, it doesn't mean that we are, uh, we are immune to this kind, of, uh, this kind of violence. And I've already spoken for four minutes, so I want to end it there. No, absolutely. I mean, I could just keep, keep listening. Um, but I'm also um, really keen to, to hand over to Alicia to sort of open with some, some remarks about, you know, maybe from the UK's perspective or just your experience. Why is the responsibility to protect so important for, for the region of Europe? Uh, well, thank you for inviting me, Kate, and it's lovely to speak uh, alongside these wonderful other speakers. You know, it, it is important for Europe because we need to learn from our past. Um, and as both speakers have said already, because the past leaves scars and those scars are still deep um, because of the lack of justice, because of the lack of dialogue, because of the lack of bringing together communities. I think it's also particularly important for Europe because we've acted in the past where others haven't, not always successfully, and I think that's really important, but often you see the UK and France in particular stepping forward and wanting to take action where it is needed, whether it be Libya or Syria, again, successfully or unsuccessfully. 
But I think the core point, as others said, is that this isn't just history. And we face so many challenges currently where we see division and hatred. And I think it's because we are seeing a diminution in dialogue. Dialogue is diminishing and disappearing in our communities in the place of headlines and sound bites and pictures and images. And in the modern era, with the pl plethora of information available to people, it's causing psychologically this acute need for certainty, for binaries, it's black or it's white. Um, it's causing people to seek out and be able to find uh, communities where they can reinforce the biases that they have. And that's allowing this revision of history, this diminishing of atrocities, and enforcement of this community, the lack of community cohesion and kind of sowing ethnic divisions. Um, also, beyond that, we need to really look at our near abroad. This is happening in our backyard as well. This isn't just something that is happening, as Luke said, in the far off place. And Europe has specific duties um, and makes big claims about the fact that we are we stand up for R2P. And it's not just about words, it is about deeds. Um, and we are most effective, I believe, in the modern day at preventing mass atrocities when we work together as multiple countries and together we refuse to sit by. Um, but also because we also have to accept that we cannot solely rely on multilaterals, which I know not everyone will agree with me on, but we have to move away from relying on the UN Security Council because if our multilaterals are frozen, if they are being undermined on a daily basis, that cannot stop us from acting. So for me as a practitioner, I'm not a purist when it comes to RTP. I'm someone who will always look at any solution in any format in any way that will work and make a difference on the ground. Um, but yes, Europe has to really step forward because we talk a big game and actually where we lead people do follow. And from my experience at the Foreign Office, there is no country as good as the UK at bringing together different countries to work together and doing that kind of behind the scenes, bringing people together. So the UK has a very positive role that we can play and that we have to keep doing. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I was nodding along. I, I feel like um, I, I love the idea of not being a purist on R2P. I'm, I'm fairly sure some very good colleagues in our world will have said the same about me. Maybe not always um <laughs> intended as a compliment but i think it is it's it's you know how we evolve um the principle in a way that is right and ready and flexible and creative um and likewise i i think that one of the kind of exciting things for the future of r2p is how can we devolve that principle out of multilateral spaces and into national kind of governments and parliaments and so maybe I can stick with you Alicia and kind of push you a little more on on thinking you know what could the UK be doing you know as an example what could the UK do to actually integrate its commitment to R2P or replicate that commitment that has been very good at championing on the multilateral fora but of course for many many reasons that's difficult to do so what can it do within its national instruments and policies to do just exactly as you say. Um. So, so I think first of all, it is about countries recognizing that we all bring different things to the table. And I think that ability to convene different countries is one of the UK's unique selling points that it can really do internationally alongside, I think security and justice is another thing we are very good at, um, along with countering hostile state and hostile actor activities. So I think we need to, countries need to look at what they bring to the table and really invest in it. Um, but you know, Kate, since my election, I've been calling for the creation of atrocity prevention unit uh, within the UK government. That was my main uh, foreign policy ask, along with a, a review into multilaterals and a review on in what happening in Xinjiang, both of which are now taking place. Um, but with the atrocity prevention unit, I think this is something that every country should be looking to create. And obviously they've announced a conflict prevention unit. I'm not too caught up on the words. Uh, it's all about preventing atrocities and strengthening resilience. But I think we need to look again as countries as how we do this work, because too often it is left to desk officers or uh, diplomats at post to suddenly stop doing what they were doing, whether it was trade and governance or whether it was, uh, you know, local community engagement, just suddenly become experts in atrocity prevention, which means they don't have any background or experience in how to do it best practice. So I think that every country should be looking at having a model where they have somebody who is an expert in the kind of traditional political process and conflict, good governance, policy development, strategic engagement with kind of humanitarian third uh, sectors. Then you need someone who is a humanitarian aid and refugee lead to bring that experience to bear. Then you need someone who's an expert at that long-term programming, so conflict, stability, security fund of the UK, 
and measurement and evaluation. There is no point having a team as experts supposedly in adjustive prevention unless they have measures of impact and effect. I am tired of the days of us funding programmes where there is no measure of meaningful effect and outcome. Then I've also argued that we need a multilateral engagement and sanctions lead, because again, I think across too many of our countries, what's happening in Geneva is not necessarily that well connected to what we're doing in New York, let alone what posts are doing within their individual countries. We need to completely transform the way in which individual countries' diplomatic posts work with each other. And then we need a strategic communications and counter disinformation lead within any such unit, because we all know that the communications and the division with communities is absolutely key to this, and we have to spend that time countering those who are doing this um, but i also think we need to be really clear-eyed about where the threats come from and actually particularly in europe a lot of that is going to be from hostile states that is going to be from terrorist groups and cessation uh, groups that are trying to secede and we need to do the preventative work but key to that is transforming how governments talk to their publics we have infantilized the public for decades now where we've said on public national security issues um big big essentially anything to do with national security it's too complicated. You can't understand this. You don't need to know. Just know we're keeping you safe. That's not sufficient. Because that then what happens is when we do need to intervene internationally to protect, or when we need to intervene to protect ourselves, the, commun the public isn't used to having this discussion about national security and why these things are important. And they feel that it's just some far fun place that they've got no investment in. The other issue is that when that happens, we find ourselves suddenly having to engage with vulnerable communities within our own country whenever something takes place abroad where we go in to protect. And the problem is if we only engage with those vulnerable communities through a securitized lens at a time of concern, the risk is that you radicalize them, that you disengage them, that they think that they're only seen as a hostile threat, which then can become a reinforcing narrative that they take on and internalize. So every government I think in Europe needs to start having a genuine adult conversation on an ongoing basis, not just in times of crisis, with their publics about national security. Um, and then very briefly, the last thing is obviously all about, you know, businesses and institutions. We all have a responsibility within our countries to make sure that our businesses, our institutions, our governments aren't implicated in atrocities. And we need to really spend time looking at how we do that because the supply chain is key in the modern day but also how we respond to those uh, settings where there aren't conflict. So for example, Hong Kong, I think is a really, again, purists would disagree with me, but I think what the UK government has done with Hong Kong is an R2P initiative. Many people will say it's not, but I think it is. It's about preventing loss of life or significant trauma to community. So I think broadening that concept of R2P and what governments can do is really important as well. Thank you so much. I feel like that was a, something I'd like to kind of copy and paste and turn into a kind of handbook for um, not just UK governments, um, but as you say, sort of European states, I think, could just take so much from just that analysis of sort of capabilities and the need for strategy and, and the, the need to reach in to publics that are affected by um, these crimes, but also publics that feel that they are not um absolutely and um yeah thank you so much i think that there there is so much that i agree with there and would like to just kind of you're allowed to disagree as well kate <laughs> <laughs> no well i mean i i would but i just think yeah great okay we'll we'll just clip that and we'll just send it out um velma maybe i could i can turn turn to you now i mean um Alicia there was talking about these, these, these threats to kind of the near home, the near abroad, right, sort of, uh, and, and, and Luke too, you're based in Sarajevo. Um, from, from that perspective and, and drawing on your experience, um, how, how do you feel that other European states might better be integrating that concept and principle of the responsibility to protect that commitment to be reaching in and listening to communities and responding to needs within the region of, of Europe. I think you're on mute, Velma. Sorry, uh, thank you so much, Kate. I mean, I would like to mention here first uh, uh, the region of Western Balkans because I do believe that somehow it's important to, to mention what is going on in this in this ground regarding the RTP because uh, what we have currently is that on the Western Balkan countries, Albania, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Croatia voted in favor of resolution of the RTP, but while Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia didn't. 
And Croatia did propose a resolution starting that is aimed to ensure the member states can move more effectively and engage in dialogue to prevent atrocity crimes. But if we take a look that Bosnia and Serbia are not a part of this process and they didn't sign that, that is really, that is really kind of showing uh, what is going on in, in, in the Western Balkans. I mean, what can be done? And I'm going to mention a few successful initiatives being done by the UK government, because I really have to speak from the perspective of someone who is seeing the post-conflict transition on the ground. There is a couple of uh, extremely important initiatives being done in the region of Western Balkan, especially in Bosnia, related to RTP, which is, for example, the whole initiative related to Srebrenica genocide, the raising awareness and promotion through the work of remembering Srebrenica organization, but also recent development on the ground is supportive, uh, a grant being given to Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Center, a sustainable grant for developing the capacity of Srebrenica Genocide Memorial Center. That is extremely important because Srebrenica Genocide Memorial is the only state memorial existing in a country and it will have a crucial role in, in the future prevention of atrocities and the genocide denial. The second initiative I would like to mention is preventing sexual violence violence in conflict initiative and the whole work which British government uh, did uh, first of all, on the ground, because I'm going to see from the perspective of someone who is following the process related to reparation to victims of sexual violence, nothing was going on before the UK didn't step, step it in with this initiative. I'm not going to speak about um, uh, uh, necessity for, for first for uh, developing the protocol for documenting sexual violence in crime, which is now very repl replicable and it can be used in Syria, in Myanmar, in all these you know, uh, conflict or post-conflict countries uh, that have been done in Bosnia through this protocol, like literally we get the first document and set of recommendations, how you can document sexual violence in conflict. And later you can uh, uh, ask for your reparation because what was clear in Bosnia was that you know, 25 years uh, after a crime, it was really difficult that you have been victim uh, to, to prove that you have been victim of sexual violence. That is enormous contribution. I'm not going to speak about how innovative approach UK government took while they were launching this protocol and working on this initiative, incorporating the art, a civil society, government officials, not just locally, European one, but also international. I think 76 countries were participating, the foreign ministers of uh, 76 countries were participating in this, in, in this process. Uh, and the last thing, and I don't want to sound that I'm like giving too many compliments, but it's really true. The last thing, and I think for me extremely, uh, and for the whole civil society, but also the politicians and government, extremely important was incorporation of religious leaders into the process of building a peace, but also uh, a raising awareness about breaking stigma and silence, which uh, victims of sexual uh, violence and rape are facing by adopting this, uh, uh, adopting this new, um, how I would say, this new uh, resolution being signed by Muslims, Orthodox, Catholics, and Jews, religious leaders, and this landmark declaration which is actually uh, very replicable in other parts of countries. So I, I will stop here, but I do believe that there are some uh, good examples and some good work being done and it can be easily replicable somewhere, somewhere else. Thank you so much. There's, there's, there's really something, not just in those specific examples that you highlight that, I mean, I completely agree, have made such important contributions, but that in that initiative around preventing sexual violence and, and also in documentation is that the lesson of establishing horizontal collaboration that's like reaching in to affected communities, reaching out to the experts, whether they are lawyers, whether they're academics, whether they're historians, but having that national leadership and then with that national platform building multilateral support. And I think that not just the sort of specifics of the importance of that, of that protocol and those standards, but actually that model, you can have na you can take national leadership in contributing to RTP or atrocity prevention um, while bringing everyone with you or responding to what others are asking for your support on. Um, hey, if I, I, may, I, um, sure, please do, Alicia. 
um, it was just very quickly, which was just to say, I think that's a fundamental shift that's taken place since about 2015, which is when I first started doing work, you saw that countries didn't align what they were doing in each country. So you would see all these different countries funding the same sorts of program or all the money going to the same organizations. Whereas now that approach of going multilaterally, let's fund these programs, because A, it means all the countries are working towards the same effect, the same end goal, rather than what we had before, which was a complete mess. As I said, particular organizations sunking in all the money and civil society always lost out as a result because it always went to big private companies locally who pretended that they were kind of leading things. And that shift has been significant over the last four years. And I think it's one of the most important shifts that's happened within foreign policy. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of long may it continue and, and, and evolve. Um, before we, we move over to, to Luke Velma, I'm, I'm mindful that um, Tuesday saw the big um, judgment um, of the um, appeal of Gen General Mladic, um, which reconfirmed the guilty verdict and will ensure that he spends his life um, behind bars. But I, I wondered, um, given you know, your, your vast experience in, in this area, whether you might say something about the importance of justice and the pursuit of justice sort of fr from that European um, perspective, sort of what states could be doing to support international justice or maybe domestic prosecutions? Yes, yes, Kate, thank you, thank you so much for that question. And thank you so much again to UK government for accepting Radovan Karadzic, you know, to serve his life prison sentence in the UK jail. So, yeah, I mean, for us, uh, the, the Radko Mladic world, it was, the, we were waiting the longest you know, period to, to almost 26 years uh, after first indictment against him was, was raised by the prosecutor Richard Wallstone. And for us, uh, really, it was a historical, historical moment, which we were waiting for such a long time. But on another hand, um, it will definitely not bring the justice to the victims because, the, you know, the victims are still, they are still dealing with these basic uh, uh, human rights, uh, human rights um, issues like, you know, they never been able to get any reparations. They do know that this process will be never ended. They are aware also that um, all prosecutor, uh, all per uh, perpetrators will never be, never be prosecuted. And they are facing daily, you know, those people who took their beloved ones in a small community, seeing them being free. And they are aware that, it, you know, justice will never be served. But on another hand, for us, we, we, I mentioned how much we are dealing with the divided curriculums and narratives being, you know, promoted among young people, the, 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 the court legacy, and all these verdicts will be a basic and only material which we will be using in, crea in creation of the educational curriculums and the projects and activities, not just by civil society and, and non-formal education. Hopefully, we will be pushing that, you know, these verdicts and the legal legacy will be included somehow into education educational curriculums and there are some initiatives being done unfortunately only in one entity of Bosnia and Herzegovina Federation because we're divided into two entities and 10 cantons and state level whatever too many levels but there are some moves where we are trying to incorporate especially the legacy of the ICTY what I would like to say is that for us extremely important is to keep the, the close focus of the international community on the domestic courts especially the national court of BIH because uh, the National Court of BIH is ex under extremely huge political pressures, especially war, war crimes chamber. And uh, unfortunately, we had bad luck. The Prime Minister of Republic of Srpska in 2015 was insisting on uh, removing the international judges and pr prosecutors from, uh, from, from the, the, the National Court of BIH. For us, that is a huge problem because we have uh, prosecutors not being first brave enough to raise indictments, then not having enough knowledge. Then sometimes they don't even speak uh, English, but they need to use the legacy and archives of the ICTY and create indictments on the legacy they already have. So that is a, a priority focus for us. And we need to we need to urge not just on Europe, but the whole international community to help us to go through this uh, post-conflict uh, transitional period uh, while keeping a, a, fo a close focus on the, on the court, but also, you know, giving the funding to court and helping the court and understanding that court is, uh, BIH, uh, National Court is 
young court being established in 2015 without enough knowledge and experience to deal with such a complex and complicated issues like uh, crime and corruption, but also war crimes trials. So with Mladic, we didn't end this process. Unfortunately, we have so much more to do regarding the, 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 the persecution of war criminals and perpetrators. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's been remarkable watching the kind of frontiers of justice and learning that has emerged from um, attempts to prosecute and respond through justice to the atrocities that occurred in, 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 in Bosnia particularly, but, but elsewhere in, in former Yugoslavia, not just in the jurisprudence, but in all of um, the kind of cultural and social and political components that it has been sort of new ground all of the time. Um, and so much has been been learned, but of course that means that many mistakes have also been been made. Um, Luke, you, you have have been part of um, the the world of the responsibility to protect and 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 its role in particularly foreign policy making, um, and has have watched this sort of concept of R two P evolve to a more prevention oriented principle uh, with value seen, I think much more as something that is relevant, not in some places in very exceptional times, but actually sort of everywhere all of the time. Um, but sort of reflecting on, on where the conversation today has gone and, and, and your experience, um, do you think it's reasonable um, or, or am I sort of so, detaching myself from the purists of R2P, um, that the principle should be considered a useful tool much more for Europe, both in its kind of inward looking policy as well as its ex external. Could it be helpful for Europe as a region in responding to kind of the challenges that it's facing? I think absolutely, uh, because the what, what is R2P if not the fundamentally the acceptance by states of their parts uh, of the bargain of the social contract, uh, essentially that they accept that they have to protect uh, the people who are under their duty of care, whether they are their citizens or people who live in their country for whatever reason, uh, with whatever status, uh, because every human being has, uh, has rights. And we states are very bad at recognizing these rights and we are very bad at fulfilling these rights and we're even worse at granting these rights to people who may not look like us or who for whichever reason we believe we may not have a, a duty of care towards. But um, I think if we accepted in 1948 that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights in the first article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then everything we have built on that principle uh, really points towards this, this essential role of the state in making possible a good life for people. And that is where I think the R2P as, a, as an emerging norm, uh, I mean, it's, it's a solidly established norm by now. I mean, it's been around for, for, for a number of years, um, can be very helpful because it really places at the center again uh, of conflicts, this responsibility of states to uh, look after people, get help if they can't themselves look after people, and everybody else to help or intervene when there is a manifest uh, inability or unwillingness of a specific state to uh, to prevent very, very bad things from, from happening. Um, I have a very long list that I've now written up um, uh, while I was preparing for this of how states and how the multilateral system is taking international human rights law, whether that's um, established at the level of the United Nations or at regional levels like the Council of Europe, and translate that into uh, actual legal commitments, uh, which then in, in individual states um, translates into, into protection and promotion of, of human rights. Um, I'm not sure I should be reading that out because I mean, you can go on the internet and look, look at all the manifold uh, international organizations that are, are there and that are doing fantastic work, I should say, because there's, there's not, I mean, there's dozens of such international organizations, there's hundreds and thousands of NGOs, but there's millions of people uh, worldwide working for, for peace. And in fact, there's billions of people working for peace every day in their community, in their village, in their in their part of their of their of their city. Uh, otherwise, humanity wouldn't have gotten to uh, to as far as it has gotten. And it's it's a very it's a very uh, positive and optimistic thing. Um, it doesn't, however, 
uh, take away the responsibility, the core responsibility of states to do what they what they can uh, to make sure that, uh, that 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 those rights are realized. And I think that's uh, uh, R2P is really the the most extreme uh, form of of those. Uh, I mean, of that of the failure of states uh, in so many places around the world uh, to uh, to fulfill these responsibilities. Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I can speak to about about prevention, if if you'd like. I mean, we've we've started talking about uh, fighting impunity. Uh, I think the the case of uh, of Bosnia is is absolutely central in the developing of the understanding we have of uh, international criminal law. Uh, the uh, um, International uh, Criminal Court uh, was founded on the realizations of, uh, of the failures of the International Court of Justice and, and other um, regional courts uh, to, to really give, uh, give justice to victims uh, in the last resort. Um, there was also a question on the political economy of conflict that I've, I've, I've volunteered to answer in, in the conversation. Kate, with your permission, I'd, I'd happily jump to that as well. And I'm keeping an eye on the clock um, because I know there's there's not a lot of time. No, please. Yeah, I mean that that's um, fabulous. Um, I just I kind of want I want us to go in all of these different directions. If we were all together, then we would be able to debrief afterwards and keep the conversation. Should I do a minute on political economy? Yeah, and please then, do. Please do. Because that opens that opens up so many other other avenues of, of discussions. I think something that I mean the, the question was, uh, and I want to do it justice. Um, the uh, yeah, polit economic and political interests shape responses to atrocities, and it's important for the EU individual me EU member states and so on and so forth. Really, it's the question about finding a, an equilibrium uh, between your your values your principles uh, your long term uh, idea that peace must be preserved and and people must uh, must must have their human rights respected and your short term self interested economic uh, uh, um, interests and, and and gains and um i think in many ways it's a it's very often a false dichotomy uh, we have as a european union but also beyond in the greater Europe and, and indeed the United Nations framework, we have to look at the long picture first and at the uh, strategic issue of preserving peace and preserving and, and also um, uh, building a fair global political economy in which people, everybody stands to gain, not just a, a tiny extractive minority. Um, we have to get much better at understanding uh, the conflict systems and, uh, and, and conflict dynamics and the economic, political economic side of conflict dynamics. Conflicts continue because somebody believes it's in their interest uh, and very often in their pecuniary interest to, to, uh, to, for them to continue. And so uh, it's been said that we need uh, responsible, uh, sustainable value chains. Uh, business and human rights is an important uh, UN, um, I think, area of work uh, that, needs to be, that needs to be considered. Um, but it also goes to states' responsibilities to um, make sure that things like the uh, international financial system is fair and transparent and that we give ourselves the tools to tackle uh, authoritarian kleptocracy as well, and that we don't uh, willingly cooperate with uh, dictators who try to stash away their money and uh, uh, very often the proceeds from, from crimes, uh, some of which uh, are also linked to, to crimes against humanity. So I think it's, it's really an, an issue where the EU is doing a lot, where it could be doing more, and where, again, the onus lies very much on, on member states. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm convinced that it's the next frontier, I think, for atrocity prevention and upholding R2P is to do exactly that. And I think it goes to Alicia's point earlier of this need to look at consistency and also avoiding the risk of complicity, um, sort of whether that's through supply chains or kind of the very advice that you um, give your, your businesses um, in it operating in certain situations. And I'm, I'm sure that that will continue to evolve. Um, and, and some states no, no doubt will get there sooner than, than others. Um, I will pose sort of I, I like my last question, but I, I see many rich questions coming through the Q and A. Um, so maybe if you can sort of keep your answers um, relatively brief, but also I don't want to constrict you because this is the kind of the question of today's conversation, um, which, which is really to all of you. So how, what is the answer then to how European states can integrate their commitments to R2P in domestic and international policy? Actually, I'm not gonna go to Alicia on this because I think she's already 
um, absolutely sort of smashed that answer for, for what the UK can do and as a blueprint for what other European states can do. But I definitely want to give Velma and Luke the chance to kind of um, come in with anything in, in, in addition or to push back on maybe some of um, the suggestions that have been um, already given. And then we'll go to some of the rich conversation um, questions that others have put in, in the Q&A box. So let's go to Velma first and then Luke, if there's anything to build on on that. And of course, Alicia, if there's anything else that, that comes to mind from um, your already kind of comprehensive um, roadmap for states, then please do jump in. Uh, I mean, it, it's been repeatedly said that preventing atrocity crimes uh, requires whole society. So I'm going to speak from that perspective and as well, the grassroots work or people-centered approach. And both, both of these approaches are, are uh, actually need to, and they require incorporation of individuals and media and community forms and other forms of civil society. I do believe the dialogue must exist on all levels as well with governments, authorities, but also is um, impossible to think that governments and states uh, can uphold their responsibility preventing crimes and, and, and using RTP without cooperation with the close cooperation with civil society, but also other factors like academia, media, uh, even ordinary people. And I do believe, and I will speak from the perspective of civil society, a worker, field worker, let's say more on being on the grassroots level, that civil society organizations cannot, sometimes we did see this through work we did with our, uh, through our collaborative approach working with the United Nations Office of Special Advisor for Genocide Prevention and Responsibility to Protect. Sometimes we did see the civil society organization cannot understand. And it often comes, uh, uh, to understand what their role in early warning mechanism and system can be. They are not enough educated. They cannot recognize you know, their central role into that. So I do believe that a grassroots organizations and non-governmental organization has to be a more a better educated and equipped with the knowledge and understand that they are on the ground workers, uh, uh, a grassroots base, but that th this system can engage in the whole system of using the RPP and the genocide prevention or um, atrocity preventions. Uh, civil society organizations, they also need to work with national human rights institutions to monitor and implement those do uh, domestic legal, for example, framework, uh, ensuring that in this way, uh, we, will, we will incorporate into the larger process. I do believe that, and I'm going to urge on a, a, a stronger support to civil society. Trust me, uh, when we started to work on the genocide and mass atrocity prevention 10 years ago, we have been said by donors that we are working on all fashion topics from 90s. We couldn't raise any funding. The only support for educating more than 100 civil society organizations through years with United Nations Office of Special Advisor for Genocide Prevention through whole region, incorporating them in into the whole coalition of 30 leading civil society organizations that the necessity for uh, giving the, 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 the funding for this initiative didn't exist. And now 10 years after when we have all these rehabilitation and genocide denial and a and, and, and huger uh, division on the ground, uh, you know, is coming back. So we need to understand that this is a long process and we need to have a better, better uh, support, but also we need to be included in the whole process and being listened. So I will stop here, Kate. No, absolutely. I mean, and, and what a kind of um, powerful call for that, that people-centered whole of society approach. And I think it, it sort of, it's the necessary um, companion to everything that Alicia said um, uh, earlier on. And, so-called top-down or bottom-up strategies are never sufficient. You need those horizontal approaches to change that incorporate and connect everyone. And I'm, I'm really struck as, as we're all talking, something that I've, I've, I've really suspected for some time that the evolution of the responsibility to protect is moving away from a concept of it being narrow but deep. And actually it's, um, it's more prevalent than that. Um, it's actually more about a kind of a constant to always be integrated and always have in your decision making um, and thinking. And I, I second you completely on the issue of funding. I mean, it's all very well talking about whole of society approach and the value of civil society. Um, but if there isn't the funds to kind of keep the work going and actually atrocity prevention is so much cheaper than response. And yet still it represents an absolutely minuscule um, component 
of um, contributions on, on human rights and violence prevention. Um, Luke, do you have what, anything to sort of add to um, what, what European states can be doing themselves to be integrating um, this principle in a, in a meaningful way? I mean, it's, it's what I would always uh, also recommend to um, to political leaders that we have to we have to put our money where our mouth is, of course, uh, and we do have to snap out of the uh, the decades old or decade old uh, austerity mindset now that's really hobbled civil society. That's also hobbled uh, uh, governments uh, around the world uh, because we've. Uh, We've uh, preferred to believe uh, um, um, rather outdated uh, economic theories that uh, um, austerity is uh, is better than investment, and uh, um, I think that's that's one thing. Getting out of that and making sure that the uh, um, those people who are on the ground, who are living with communities, communities themselves have the tools and the means to uh, prevent conflict and to uh, break out of uh, sometimes generations long conflict dynamics. Um, I think we also need to um, well remember what what uh, all of this we are doing uh, as uh, as states uh, is for that we are uh, have decided to um, uh, as it says in the in the UN Charter to uh, end the scourge of war that uh, back then twice in the lifetimes of those who had written the charter had brought untold suffering to humankind um, and that that has a it brings a great responsibility with it uh, now I'm quoting from spider-man um, really this uh, this idea that uh, uh, it is it is not just uh, preventing genocide mass atrocities and and uh, crimes against humanity and so on and so forth it is really playing your role as a responsible government, uh, uh, the, the member of parliament uh, uh, said it, we need to shift away from a state-centric uh, uh, paradigm of security uh, towards a human-centric one, one that places uh, human beings at the, at the center of, uh, of government attention and that really uh, moves away from these uh, uh, these policies we've now pursued for 20 years of a uh, forever war against terrorism, which uh, has mainly brought uh, more suffering and, and really very few, uh, very few solutions. Um, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of states are taking those responsibilities. We've heard about uh, France and the UK, neither of which has used their veto uh, uh, in over a generation. 1989 was the last time they used it. Um, we're also seeing ways to work around these kinds of blockages that we have. Uh, there was a presentation just a, a few days ago by an excellent report by the uh, Asia Pacific Center for the Responsibility to Protect on the Powers of the UN General Assembly uh, to prevent and respond to mass atrocity crimes, which I'd recommend uh, everybody should look at because that will get us beyond the blockages uh, when powerful states decide that uh, they will put their interests above the uh, uh, the public interest or the public or the interest of, uh, of victims of uh, mass across atrocities of conflict. Uh, and finally, for the European Union, I think it's it's really about um, also breaking out of these uh, these uh, this bickering that we have between the 27 of us over over um, who re resettles how many uh, refugees and uh, really reuniting around the common purpose because we'll need a lot more unity in the future when we want to tackle the climate crisis that we have when we want to tackle the deep uh, uh, economic uh, inequalities and injustices that we are facing when we want to bring an end to the conflicts of the uh, of our near abroad and also further further in the world uh, and of course uh, if we want to bring an end to the uh, the deadly pandemic that's going on and i'm very happy to know that uh, uh, finally after months and months of uh, of uh, uh, prevarication the European Union has finally come around yesterday at the uh, uh, the trips council of the World Trade Organization and is now accepting uh, to talk about a, a waiver for uh, intellectual property rights uh, uh, for COVID vaccines so I think that's that is progress so uh, perhaps to end on that there is an enormous amount of positive progress going on uh, we just need to know where to look for it. Um, thank you I, I mean I really enjoyed actually how positive this whole conversation has has been it feels like actually we've done such a great survey of fantastic stuff that's already been doing can be done and charting or marking out what could be a roadmap for r2p's evolution in europe um alicia is there anything that you would like to add on what states um could or should be doing and implementing um or i um have a question for you in 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 the chat it's entirely up up to you 
Um, I'll keep it incredibly brief so I can can do it, but I was, I was writing notes furiously while uh, my colleagues were speaking, and I was looking at what is the preventative environment that we need to create at home and abroad. And for me, there were a few things that came out, which was, first of all, the dialogue point. Uh, we need to invest in dialogue. Dialogue is key. That is how you end division. And as part of that is education. Um, there is nothing so moving, heartbreaking and chilling as visiting Srebrenica. Uh, we need to fund educational visits, we need to fund it in our curriculum, we need to make sure we look at the modern day atrocities within our young people, not just those 16 to 18 who study politics, people aged 11 to 16 need to understand this happens on our doorstep and it can still happen. Second is security and justice reform, uh, that is key to creating a preventive environment. The next is human rights programmes, particularly focused on ethnic tensions and uh, conflict between uh, any community groups. Good governance is the other key pit to preventive environment. The media ecosystem, we need to invest in a positive media ecosystem. And that doesn't just mean our you know, newspapers, it means how people engage on a one-to-one -one basis and within their communities. And finally, I think a real uh, parliamentarians need to be looking at counter hostile state and act to legislation because we cannot have a positive environment if we do not deal with those threats that are coming to us. Um, but that was kind of, just thinking through our conversation the last few minutes, those are kind of key pillars that came out. But I'll yeah, later. no, ab ab absolutely. Um, and I mean, this point of education, I think, has come up from from all of you in in different ways. And it's just it's just the most sustainable and cost effective means of preventing all sorts of things. And we just need to radically change what education, I think, means everywhere. Um, so I, I have a question. I think we can squeeze in one question, um, which I might direct to you, Alicia, because it's about Europe, R2P and LGBTQ plus rights. And I know that you've done so much work um, in, 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 in your short time in Parliament so far, um, and, and particularly against conversion therapy. And it's a question from Jess Gifkins, um, who we're actually doing some work together on um, LGBTQ rights and, and atrocity prevention. And she's risen across many parts of Europe. We're seeing escalating persecution of hate crimes against LGBT plus people. The situation in Poland and Hungary are extreme examples of this, but also here in the UK, hate crimes on the basis of sexual orientation have doubled in the last five years. And hate crime against transgender people have tripled in five years. Does implementation of R2P require greater attention to LGBT plus people as a group who face greater persecution in Europe? And I suppose this also speaks to this kind of developing the concept of R2P and ensuring um, everyone is able to, to be protected by it. Um, but Alicia, I don't know if you want to say a few words on that and then open it to see if, if Luke or, or Velma would like to add anything. I mean, I, I think you're completely right. R2P, I think, can become too, uh, too focused on the kind of generalities. Um, something that struck me when I went to Shebrenitz was the lack of conversation about the women who were raped. It broke my heart that that was not a conversation that was taking place despite the fact those women will relive that trauma every single day, sometimes looking at the face of their child or sometimes just because of what they have gone through. The same thing with LGBT, we do not look at this enough. Um, it is very difficult in Europe. The conversation taking place amongst politicians in some countries is vile and it is radicalizing and it is dangerous and people's lives are being put at risk as a result. Um, I have led the campaign in Parliament in the UK for the ban on LGBTQ plus conversion therapy, which was announced in the Queen's speech. That conversion therapy is still legal in the majority of countries around the world. So whilst it is legal, that empowers politicians to be able to go around and say what they want about the fact that being gay is a sickness or that people can be fixed or that they don't deserve to be loved. We need to educate, we need to legislate, we need a framework for justice and we need a framework for people and funding for people to be able to access support and to whistle blow. Um, but I am, I'm sickened by what I see, particularly the conversation in certain countries within Europe and we have to do better. And that demands politicians to stand up and do better. Um, and it demands us to fight the systems where politicians who are elected represent the views of, um, it doesn't matter if you have views that you might personally believe in, you are there to represent the mass and the broad range of people but there are certain views that I think have no place um, in a representative democracy. Um, so I'm pleased that there are more actually, I'm pleased that there are more crimes being reported on LGBTQ plus hate crime because it wasn't being reported because people felt ashamed because they were, they were taught that they should be ashamed and therefore they don't deserve justice. So in some ways the higher figures are good, which I know sounds twisted in some ways, um, but we need to do more 
Um, and obviously, as I touched on there, there are some ways that we can start to do so. Thanks ever so much. Unfortunately, I think we will have to end it there because I, I know how busy people are and um, we've just reached the top of the hour. Um, I could keep going for, um, you know, much, much longer. It's, it's such a rich conversation um, and just enormous thanks to our panelists, Alicia, Velma and Luke. Um, and I hope to all of you in the audience, this has whet your appetite for our seminar series, um, that you'll stay with us for um, the course over the, the remainder of um, 2021. Our next webinar, is going to look at Europe's responsibility to protect in Myanmar and will be hosted by the fantastic Adrian Gallagher. Um, so stay tuned for more information on that. Um, there has been so much food for thought in this uh, short hour and I have just enjoyed it immensely. So huge thanks for giving your time to our panelists, not only your time, your brains. Um, please continue your fantastic leadership efforts um, as we continue to evolve and push forward the principle of R2P and the implementation of atrocity prevention. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic rest of your days. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone.